Buongiorno a tutti, eh, siamo qui dall'Accademia Albertina di Torino per la seconda sessione del ciclo di seminari Vision Rail organizzati da TED. Eh, il titolo di questa seconda sessione è Tecnologie e Ingegneria al servizio dei grandi tunnel, delle grandi infrastrutture. Ora, ehm, sottolineo il termine vision rail, visione, no? Il termine visione è una parola che a me piace molto perché ci porta verso il futuro, ma in questo caso ci può portare oggi, nella giornata di oggi, ci porta anche nel passato, a esplorare il passato. È un termine plurisenso che è molto indicato per quello che andremo a raccontare nella giornata di oggi. Eh, mi presento, io sono uh, My name is Apostolo, Fabrizio Apostolo, sono direttore editoriale della rivista Le Strade, una rivista che si occupa di strutture di trasporto a tutto campo, e parlando di visioni nel passato, la vera notizia è che oggi, insomma, con la We can go back to 150 years ago, the 17th of September 1871, the um, railway tunnel, uh, the Fraser's railway tunnel was inaugurated, the first major engineering tunnel uh, of allora, international importance. So 1871, my magazine was founded in 1888. It is called Le Strade, The Roads. So these two realities based on a dream, the medaille dream Mr. Cialdini is going to talk about. We are going to discover the whole history of this tunnel in the first part of this seminar. And then the road based on the dream of Massimo Tedeschi, an engineer from Turin. He was born in, here in Turin. And he was a visionary and the best possible meaning of this term. So this is a common origin. Roman roads, you know that Roman roads were the first, let's say, the ancestor of our railway lines. So another key word in this meeting is art, because we are in the temple of art, the Accademia Bertina, fine arts. What has it to do with engineering? So engineering arts, obviously our engineers know very well, they are creating this new major infrastructures. Some years ago, TELT organized uh, an exhibition the artwork exhibition within, inside the, uh, the tunnel. And it clearly showed the relationship within, uh, between infrastructure and art, which is strengthened uh, by a number of initiatives we are going to hear about today. I'm going to introduce our guests. But artwork itself is, an is, an, um, is a term that is used in the art world, but also in the engineering world. So there is this lexical um, link. So the first speaker we are going to listen to is Mr. Eduardo Di Mauro, the uh, director of Academia Bettina, so our landlord. We are going to listen to his intervention now. Thank you. Th I thank also Child for choosing Academia Bettina for this very interesting seminar of today. So I'm going to greet you all today on behalf, mainly on behalf of the President, Mrs. Paola Bribaudo, that you know personally. Unfortunately, she had an accident, uh, not a very serious one, but she's injured now, so she can't be here. She'll be back very soon, though. Obviously, I would like to thank TELT for choosing Academia Bettina, but there's a reason for that, so this choice was not a chance. We are the temple of art, but art does not live only in an ideal dimension. It also translates into practical daily life, because the actual etymology of the word um, art, as you know, is techne. So technical uh, craftsmanship and everything. So the relationship between art and science would be very difficult to explain, but this has always been a very fruitful relationship. relationship. So art and science 
in history had different uh, paths, but this common path was uh, restored. And Academia Albertina, which is living this pandemic crisis with strong will, last year we opened, we were the first um, institution to reopen our labs in December, obviously with safety measures, but we continued our education activities, exhibitions, um, debates. So we actually reacted to this crisis that seems to be solved or almost solved now. So one of our goal is an historic goal of Academia Albertina. It's not just a, a present goal. Uh, is to provide our students with tools to intervene in daily life with their um, projects and creativity. Today our students carry out um, a, um, labs, workshops, they create brands that are winning uh, and that are getting awards, so we are supporting them uh, through our labs, painting labs, um, sculpture, decoration, but also through a number of new schools like engineering for enterprises, so design workshops, new technologies, and theoretical um, classes, communication and management of uh, the um, cultural heritage. We know that official delays are quite long, but we'll have a new school for cinema uh, to create new professions that we are cultivating here. So during the pandemic crisis, we used our teachers, were able to uh, cooperate with our students to create streaming connections uh, to communicate that are very, very useful and that we'll keep using because technology should be used on a, on a daily basis also after the pandemic, as we discovered that technology is a very precious tool for communication. So more specifically, this is a celebration of an enormous, a major uh, infrastructure, the Fraser's Tunnel, in the second half of the 19th century, that was celebrated uh, with a monument that was placed in 1879 in Piazza Statuto here in Turin. And as sometimes happens quite often, despite such a monument, it would be difficult to design for a number of um, questions um, on a number of issues, but this was born from an idea of a precedent, the precedent of the Academia Bertina of that time, because it, this institution has always been on a very important position between the precedent, uh, the presidency in charge of external relationships and the, the management. And so this cooperation created our project. And so Count Di Veglia, mm, the president of Academia Bettina, had the idea to create this monument. And Gibelli created it. And then everything was realized by, by Professor Eduardo Tabacchi, together with his uh, sculpture student actually uh, carried out and performed this monument, which is still there. It needs some servicing because now we have this light installation that celebrates this monument. But we know that after this period, there are a couple of things to be adjusted and, and restored. But this is uh, one of our symbols. So maybe during works or at the end of the works, You'll be welcomed to our Pinacoteca, to our gallery, where our friend, Mr. Zanellati, and maybe some others will help you, will um, guide you through the new uh, works of art that we have in our gallery. But you will be also able to see specific installations um, that have to do with the topics of this meeting, so the actual working tools of Eduardo Tabacchi. I think this is very useful and interesting, and a portrait of Giacomo Grosso, by Giacomo Grosso, and so this portrait of Count Velio. 
it is very interesting to know that celebrations of Frederick's uh, channels coincide with the inauguration of an exhibition of Academia Albertina that I invite you, invite you to visit, which is absolutely in line with this design and historic dimension and the basis of the Frederick's tunnel and its monument. This exhibition was designed by a president called Drawing the City. So the Academia Albertina in Turin. Uh, well, this exhibition is based on the archives of Academia Albertina because you know that you have an heritage as our institutions, but also in Turin, in the whole city, that can be used. Here in our Academia, we um, selected a number of drawings and projects because our students used to design very a lot of places in Turin, the Cafe Baratti Milano and other historical um, buildings in different times in history uh, bef before uh, the excavation of the Frederick Tunnel. So after the unity in the second half of 19th century and the early 20th century, uh, Turin was very optimistic to um, the progression of history and of humanity thanks to the progress in science, medicine, and um, industrial development, that time was aiming at a perennial um, peace. That was not true, but that was the climate that people were living in that time in the Belle Epoque. So I think that this exhibition is absolutely in line with the topics dealt with uh, when talking about the Frisius Tunnel. So in the catalog that was printed, we have this title, Genius of Art for the Genius of Science. So this relationship between art and science, which is absolutely uh, um, current today. So talking about exhibition tonight, We'll see another exhibition organized by TELT with the Museum of Risorgimento to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Frejus Tunnel. I now invite architect Mario Villano, general director of TELT, who is going to talk about this initiative and other initiatives linked to these very important uh, celebrations. And then we'll talk about the future, just to create a first bridge towards the second part of this meeting. Welcome and thank you. Good morning, thank you. Thanks also to uh, Mr. Di Mauro for what he said. Vision Rail. It was born from the fact that the European Commission launched a consultation for the European Year of Rail. So we worked a lot, a number of different actors. You could see the logos at the beginning of the meeting, so TELT, but also BBT for the Brenner uh, Tunnel, the railway connection, so the tunnel of the Pertus towards Spain, the port of Barcelona, the MED corridor for freight, Mercitalia, and the consultation also saw the participation of the Port Authority of um, Genoa. 2021 became the European Year of Rail, and it was because this um, topic is really rooted in the past. We are going to listen to this uh, topic explained. 150th anniversary of the inauguration of the Frejus Tunnel, as we said, first of all. 
This is exactly today, so the 17th of September 1871, which was Friday, just like today. So sometimes Friday the 17th is not unlucky, sometimes it has a very long break. So, 150th anniversary of the first railway collection, um, connection between two capital cities, Paris and Brussels. 14th anniversary of high-speed railway connections. The first year were railway, uh, the rail um, regulations that were harmonized for interoperability and a number of other celebrations that will uh, be dealt with during the next intervention we are going to hear. Vision Rail, so when joining this consultation of the European Commission, this group of promoters promoted the idea to carry out a number, to um, hold a number of seminars. The first was on the 16th of June and was focused on environment, which is just a part, a fundamental part of our infrastructures of our work. And then today, the 17th of September, talking, we are going to talk about technologies. And then a third part on the 10th of November to talk about intermodality and the actual um, use of these technologies. So these uh, seminars are going to be, hold, be held during a f an intermediate phase between uh, the online conferencing and the traditional conferencing. We hope that we'll move back towards um, a live uh, event. But the actual audience we're going to talk about today is very large, and it is um, made of experts, internationally renowned experts, and institutions at a national and European level. So this is a seed that will uh, uh, create a very important plant. Thanks to the suggestions that will be shared. And everything will be collected in a book that will talk about, will be, uh, let's say, the summary of this European Year of Rail 2021. This being said, I would like to say a couple of words about a couple of topics that are very important to us and that have to do with technologies, which is the topic of today's meeting. So first of all, we are living in a time dimension that does not only have with past, present, and future. There is a number of intertwined uh, connections that link different aspects. Technological innovation is a process, but it is a process which is rooted on experiences that uh, were in the past. The past is not just what we always we have already lived. It is something that keeps living in our experiences, what we are living and experiencing today. So 1871, everything started in 1856 when the um, authorities uh, decided make the key decisions to guarantee 150 years of development and that are still guaranteeing and allowing us to live based on that 
decision on that action, thus making it evident that we have a task today. We need, we have to create new infrastructures to, uh, to follow on this reality. So that authorities had an extraordinary vision but not for that time only. It is extraordinary on absolute terms. So just 10 seconds to read something that you surely know. You can find it in the book. But I will read a declaration of vote, 1856, 25th of June in Menabrea. Mr. Benambrea was a mathematician, a minister, really important character, who has to support Cavour's position, who already held a very interesting introduction of like 20 lines, so this ability to be concise and, and brief. This is something that we have to learn from the past. So this declaration of vote is 10 lines long, and it summarizes, well, if I, I could read it without telling you that it is by Menabrea, because you could think it is by Ursula von der Leyen, or I could say Jacques Delors, Romano Prodi, any uh, person that represented and are still representing our Europe. So Menabrea 1856 said, I believe in the certain future, the opening of Suez Canal, because I'm sure that Europe one year after the Sedan war between France and Europe and, and uh, Germany, Europe will end up understanding that a condition for its own survival is to open up this way towards the Indies and the Chinese Sea to balance the power of a population that is growing very fast and is becoming a very a giant population on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So I can say that the future of a very small country that was here, right around Palazzo Carignano and Turin, so the future of a little country will be assured. It will reach a degree of richness that cannot be imagined today because it will be the first passage of transportation and, and trade between Europe and the Eastern world. So you already have Xi Jinping and everything here. Mm? So, Grattoni, Grattoni, Grandi, Sommeieses are all very important people who are living in this cultural um, environment. And it is up to us now to work uh, with our governments at a national and European level, because generally this process, this positive symbiosis between uh, the knowledge, the know-how, and uh, responsibilities to take, to make decisions, this must be a very direct chain of decision, and we need to be really aware of the consequences. So this is a very important lesson that links so many years boring machines, Menabrea's words, and the infrastructures that were built. So if possible, I'd like to show you, here it is, the picture of the monument Professor was talking about. You can see that the way it is um, decorated now until the 10th of October. So this is an installation that by Ricky Ferrero with the sponsorship of the city of Turin. This is a new thing, uh, talking about uh, Lyon Turin railway line and the uh, Piedmont region and the Museum of Risorgimento, the Accademia Albertina, all the technical partners like Iren and GTT, 
And I repeat, Ricit Ferrero reinvented this monument from a visual point of view using flowers and sculptures. So something rocks, something that is very far from the mere technical aspects of excavating materials, there's heavy materials that are carried away, etc. So this is not by chance. This message was agreed upon because even technology and even science lives in their own times in their own evolutions. So this is this does not follow a parallel world that has nothing to do with the value chains and the values, sorry, that uh, we are living today. So in our contemporary world, the topic of a technology that is becoming, we could say, that is becoming a sweet, soft technology that is sensitive to the effects it causes. So the general environmental problems, which is not a barrier that should not be exceeded. It, this is not enough. We should be able to master our activities and to master and respect and enhance values which are of environmental nature from different point of view, points of view. So the use that Ricky Ferrero made of flowers is a clear message that changes the paradigm of technology, of genius, of science, which is on top of the monument. It was the representation of a conflict uh, compared to nature. So it is a sort of um, poetry in this conflict. So the, a vision of positive trust in science that was uh, real at that time. Today we are talking about, we, we have a different idea of science that is quantistic, that is relativistic, we could say. So we have very different scenarios uh, that are far more complex also from the point of view of uh, trust that we have the um, confidence, which is not a puristic. We know that also the, uh, the general public does not always trust uh, science 100%. People need to be convinced. People need to be um, aware. And this topic does not only have to do with vaccines. It also has to do with uh, tunnels. We know that the social, political aspect and dimension is extremely important. We could, we were able to uh, to see that participation is very important. We need to know that this is the truth. So the meaning of this changing paradigm and the relationship between human and nature, technology and existing value systems. I, all this has to do, is very important also in the general um, dimension that we are sharing. So Ricky Ferrero's work follows this line, the use of light that is itself the most immaterial, the most intangible, intangible element that is conveying this kind of messages are Tunnels will be hyper-connected, full of technology, full of messages of different kind, monitoring systems, and a completely different attention, which is much closer to the individual experiences of people through uh, mobile phones, remote control, and everything, uh, all what we have in our daily lives today, well, especially young people who are living in this new situation. 
So when we're talking about technologies, we talk about past technologies and present technologies, but we mainly talk about the new vision where there's multiple topics that have to do with sciences and technologies. They are developed, uh, keeping in mind that the old fracture between science based on physics and what all what is outside this dimension is absolutely something that belongs to the past. Human sciences themselves are science. Even if they use different methodologies and paradigms, but they are just as important and credible. So our relationship within the world of science cannot do without these dimensions. So it is not by chance that we created um, not a, an office, a division for development, sustainable development that deals with economy, uh, development environment. So all the different aspects of our um, work and infrastructures. So vision rail is a 360 degree uh, event that is divided into different um, topics. So today we're going to talk about technologies, but these are not separate worlds. They all belong to the same, we could say, container where all the topics should be organized and they are all interconnected. So your contribution for this kind of effort that we are making and for, well, this is very important to us. The moderator today told us that today in the afternoon we are going to inaugurate an exhibition in the best location, which is the Museum of Risorgimento, Palazzo Carignano, here in Turin. Let me say that this monument that you could see, there is something that I would like to uh, to show you. That mean that is that. Well, we talked about how it was uh, invented and created, but I would like to talk about the origin of this work of art. That is the huge effect of that infrastructure at that time. And the monument was financed, was funded by a collection of all workers' associations in Italy, in the whole of Italy. The Italy was already united at that time. And this infrastructure was um, conceived when the uh, Kingdom of Sardinia was still there, but all the associations also from the south of Italy contributed to fund this infrastructure. We could talk about different, let's say, art um, opinions, but this is a message, a monument to work because it was paid by workers. 48 workers died during the construction of the tunnel. These people were forgotten. We always talk about science, technology, machines, politics. Those 48 people were a bit forgotten. So for the first time, we talked about this in the Museum of Risorgimento to celebrate these victims. And again, we have this relationship, relationship between past and future, which is a multiple relationship, because we talk about the victims of that time and we commit to do all what is possible and even more to avoid this to happen in our working sites today. So besides the natural evolution of working conditions, but the topic, well, there's the um, 
victims the workplace, accidents in the workplace is a very important topic. We keep talking about this. Also, the President of the Republic talked about this recently. So we are confirming this commitment of ours thanks to a program that is called Mission S, Mission Safety, that is to aim at that zero and minimum accident. I cannot guarantee we reach this goal, but what I can guarantee is that in terms of training methodologies and technologies, we'll absolutely uh, can uh, use the best experiences in the world to meet these needs. This is something that we owe to our companies, to our workers, to the works at workers that work for uh, enterprises, for companies that work for us. And also in terms of memory of this 48 people who died and that the monument is celebrating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Virano, for your overview. So just uh, to uh, summarize uh, all the information that Mr. Virano said, I uh, thought of three key uh, terms, uh, culture, technical culture, training, diffused cultures, then community, networking, working together, and then cooperation in the sense that cooperating systems uh, are found in the smart roads or, or in different uh, domains. So the human and technological factors inherent in this uh, sense of time should always be present. And sh we should make all efforts to keep this uh, cultural flow alive. So now it is up to uh, Mr. Pasquale Cialdini, Secretary of uh, Civil Engineering Association, an expert uh, in this sector, renowned among the uh, technical community. So he's going to speak about the history of the first uh, tunnel of the Alps. Uh, he is connected from Rome. Uh, so uh, we are dealing with the whole world. And uh, the title of his speech is the history of the first Alpine tunnel and of the man who made it. So uh, not only machines, but also men, men who were engineers uh, who designed uh, the work and then the man who went there and excavate with their hands. So uh, without much ado, may I leave the floor to Mr. Cialdini. So, because we've been uh, friends uh, for um, many years, uh, may I ask you to shorten uh, your uh, speech because uh, we are running slightly late. So, please uh, try to stick with the time. Ben. All right, thank you very much. Saluto tutti. Uh, may I? Thank uh, everybody. May I welcome Mr. Virano, the director of uh, Academia Albertina, and of course, uh, all the participants uh, and the audience. So we have uh, the presidents of Civil Engineering Association. As you, you'll hear from my speech, en engineers and uh, inspectors from the civil engineering are the main drivers of this work. So uh, um, I shortened my speech a little bit just to stick to the timing. However, I have a much longer uh, presentation, uh, almost twice as much, so that you can have all the details there. So without much ado, before speaking of the tunnel, we must remember uh, how people had to travel across the Alps uh, without the tunnel. So uh, we are dealing with Moncenisio, Monsigny Road, uh, restructured and refurbished by Napoleon, between Novalesa in Piedmont and Landsberg in Savoy, uh, 
were separated by six hours uh, road because people, of course, traveled by coach and uh, people had to stop at the shelters you see here in, in the picture. They had to uh, uh, use the slates and wait there for the climate conditions to improve before going on with their trip. So in 1839, uh, there's a, a person from the Sousa Valley, and it's so crucial to highlight it. It was um, an autochthonous uh, in inhabitants. Uh, it's Mr. Uh, Giuseppe Francesco Medaille. He was a customs inspector and uh, he thought that the best way to connect Piedmont and Savoy through a tunnel between Berdenek and Modan. Uh, this is why he drafted a report uh, and they sent it to the government. Uh, no replies were done, and the year, uh, the year after, he sent a further report with some um, surveys uh, and pictures. Uh, in 1841, he sent a third report to uh, Charles Albert directly. So uh, I have two words from him. All the enlightened spirits know that quick and easy communication ways are the essential foundation for nation prosperity. And he concluded by saying that the Alpine tunnels uh, will make a terri territory thrive and uh, he will make even the Genoa port thrive, becoming the first port in Europe. So there was much more at stake, not only the connection between Piedmont and Savoy, but uh, the sea to the mountains. So uh, that was the dawn of intermodal uh, travels um, between railway and sea uh, connections. Unfortunately, he died in 1844 while traveling to Turing to speak directly to the king, Charles Albert. So this is just to give you an overview of the uh, timeline. So this is the uh, timeline showing the development of the railway network across the world, not only in Italy. So as you can see, as compared to the rest of the world, we just had one small seven kilometer long railway line from Naples to Portici. And then Piedmont started in 1848 with the first connection, eight kilometer long connection between Turin and Moncalieri. So uh, we were lagging tremendously behind in the development of our railway network at those times as compared to the rest of the world. However, uh, Piedmont uh, caught up uh, quickly. In 1846, the Ministry for Public Words sent uh, three engineers, including Sommelier and Grandis, to uh, um, specialize in Belgium and uh, in England. Why in Belgium? Because they could also have a better insight into mining, and then to England, of course, because it was the first nation developing railway networks. Uh, Cavour himself, before becoming a politician, had drafted a report on the importance of the railway network. Uh, finally, in, between, in 1848, we inaugurated the first Italian railway line, and between that year and 1857, uh, there was a huge development of roads, so 900 kilo of railway lines, sorry, 900 kilometers. So it's a record uh, we can boast uh, even today. So, in, so uh, much in such a short time. 
Unfortunately, only 700 kilometers of railway line were present in the rest of our peninsula, and Sardinia was completely left uh, beside because uh, they had n in Sardinia they had no railway lines at all. Uh, so gain Going back to Mad Isle's dream, uh, unfortunately, he died before uh, seeing it come true. Because in 1845, the King Charles Albert demanded uh, the Ministry of Public Works to uh, start working on the issue uh, and uh, called an engineer from Belgium, Mr. Henry Maus, and he became honorary inspector for the civil engineering works. And he was entitled um, to organize the uh, construction of railway network in Piedmont. So in 1849, Henry Mose delivers his design, which is submitted to the examination of the ministerial commission chaired by Pietro Paleocapa. He was uh, one of the main drivers of the tunnel uh, before serving as an inspector of the civil engineering and then as Ministry of Public Works. Uh, actually, he was the first Ministry of Public Works of United Italy in 1861. Paleocapa, too, illustrates and is convinced uh, of the huge uh, utility of this uh, work. So Mao's projects and Mao's design actually uh, takes great inspiration from Medaille's idea. So the connection between Badenesh and Modan, for example, uh, was fundamental. Uh, this is why that uh, because the railway uh, line in 1857 stopped uh, at Susa, a further tract was needed from Susa to Bardanesh, and then the tunnel had to be excavated, more than 12 kilometer long tunnel, to be precise, 12.650. Oh, uh, and then uh, connections were needed to Morian Valley and to Chambéry. So this, uh, you can see here in my slide, is Paleocapa's report. Uh, this is the cover, uh, which is kept at the Ministry of Public Works in Rome. So let's have a look at the last sentence. We are fully convinced that the impact of this work are so useful and so far-sighted that every effort is worth that. So he is conscious that this work will demand sacrifices, will demand solving so many problems in order to ensure the survival of the workers, for example, during excavation. But everything will be worth it because the benefits will be so much higher than that. So, of course, the design was the beginning, but then uh, it was not the solution. He knew that construction uh, timing uh, would have been so long because we ju they just had hammers and chisels. That was the way uh, mountains were bored. So 30 years was the calculation of the timeline uh, to excavate the tunnel in that um, working conditions. And then uh, working condition themselves inside the tunnel because the temperature would go up uh, higher and higher as uh, uh, the uh, excavation continued into the mountains. And then the fumes, uh, the fumes of the mines, because uh, as uh, the uh, stonemason would uh, work going on, they also posed mines uh, in order to go on quickly, and then uh, toxic fumes would have been released. So we really, they really needed uh, to find a way to convey fresh air 
for kilometers inside the mountains. Uh, of course, the works are started from each end, uh, and so each gallery um, would have been more than six, kilo six kilometers long. Uh, so this means they needed air, fresh air and water, uh, and last but not least, energy. The energy needed to convey fresh air inside a tunnel. Uh, so the three main engineers found the way to, uh, to use energy inside the tunnel. And they use hydraulic energy from waterfalls uh, created by Tarans, uh, both in Badenesh, Rushmore Torrent, and uh, Ark uh, River in Mudan. So they used compressor to pump water and obtain the energy needed to convey and transport air inside the tunnel. So after uh, the studies by the three engineers, uh, th they started uh, experiencing boring through a compressed air boring machine. They started uh, along the Jovi um, railway line between Turin and Genoa, but the studies were still in the early stages. In the uh, meantime, Minister Paleokapa had submitted um, his own design, and remember that Cavour was an engineer himself, so he was very competent and he could understand any design he was submitted. So together they went presenting this design uh, to ask for financing by the parliament. Virano reminded us of Menabrea and uh, his support to the work. Menabrea actually was not only uh, a member of the parliament, but also a scientist uh, himself. And uh, Cavour's speech was so driving uh, in that occasion. So this is why the work obtained the funds necessary. So here you see an extract uh, from the speech to uh, of Cavour uh, to the parliament. These are the uh, acts from the session held in 1855. So, uh, gentlemen, this is a gigantic uh, work. So uh, his execution will give glory and benefits to the country. So great uh, endeavors uh, are not done. There are immense difficulties, and uh, they are done and won only in one condition. So uh, we need to have faith, real faith, absolute faith uh, in their success. So if you have no faith, there's nothing, there's no uh, politics, there's no industry. So I am firmly convinced and I trust you and I'm sure that you will support this modern uh, enterprise. So uh, it was approved uh, uh, on that session of the Senate on the 15th of August. Uh, King uh, Victor Emmanuel II uh, enacted law number 2380, authorizing an the uh, government to start uh, tunnel works. Uh, 1st September uh, of King Emmanuel's uh, uh, inauguration of the works in Modan. So maybe... Uh, may we be so quick uh, in uh, passing from theory to practice. So here you see some pictures of the tunnel, some drawings actually. This is the map and the longitudinal profile. However, before starting 
the boring works, some preparatory works were needed. So during September and October that year, and actually the first years, um, so a long preparation, especially to build the houses for uh, the workers. Badenesh was just a, a village. Uh, they just had stables there. So uh, they started um, building wood uh, huts, uh, which were not comfortable at all uh, in, uh, in winter, especially in winter. So they built um, concrete uh, houses, and then they needed to uh, construct and build access roads because they just had some mountain tracks, but they were not enough to support um, the heavy weights uh, uh, that had to be carried there. So both ways uh, and both sides in Modan and in Bartonesh, new access roads uh, were built, and then uh, the um, itinerary of the uh, gallery needed to be traced. It, it was grandis to be awarded this uh, work along with two assistants. So here you see the uh, pictures from Badenesh and Fourneau. Fourneau is slightly high up the mountains as compared to Modan. You see the pictures before and after uh, the housing for workers were provided. So here you see the compressor, water compressors that were uh, used by sommelier, that were designed and used by sommelier Grattoni and Grandes to provide energy and uh, convey compressed air uh, not only um, for um, the workers, survivor inside the tunnels, but also to operate the boring machines. So here it follows uh, some uh, overview on how the works uh, were organized. So there were three sections. Uh, one section uh, was fully excavated and they started lying in it. Second session started from the uh, excavated sec section, which was very narrow, and then it had to be uh, slightly and increasingly extended. And then third section, uh, where um, the mountain was bored uh, through uh, mines explosions too. So that was the first step of excavation advancement. So here you see the three sections that I have just uh, illustrated. So uh, the uh, a portal, uh, intermediate, and uh, end uh, section. L'intero operazione di scavo viene chiamata muta. So the whole excavation operation is called mute. So first step, uh, they bored 80 holes uh, before. Uh, calling for the intervention of boring machines. So they started with the chisel and hammer, and then the boring machines entered into the tunnel to complete excavation. That was first step. Second step, we had they had stalkers uh, posing mines. And then in the third step, after mine explosions, all debris uh, had to be cleared from the tunnel. Here you see a view of a boring machine. It's a compressed air boring machine uh, able to um, make uh, holes with uh, 80 centimeter sections, uh, much more than the uh, holes excavated by chisel, which just had a 30 centimeter uh, radius. Uh, so again, you'll see a picture of a gun carriage where nine, nine to ten boring machines were placed, and they were all able to 
working independently one from one another. Uh, so, of course, the gun carriage needed many workers to be operated. There were some uh, workers using the boring machines directly, but then there were some others who had to push the carriage forward, and then others who were in charge of replacing boring machines so when, whenever there, uh, there could be any faults or misfunction. So here you see uh, at the top of the page a picture of a boring machine. Uh, so you're going to find this machine in uh, Porta Nuova. Uh, it, it, it was in front of Angelo Cantone's office, uh, who was uh, the director of the uh, work, the project manager, so to say, uh, in modern terms. Uh, here you see the uh, gun carriage carrying the nine boring machines with all the workers uh, in charge of operating them. So another uh, very relevant point concerns uh, the, the relationship that uh, had gone on and on and on uh, between engineers and the government of across uh, the uh, work. So here is a letter of Cavour to Sommelier saying, Dear engineer, we see that the year 8060 elapsed and uh, we couldn't activate uh, uh, Monsigny perforation, Monsigny excavation, but this is not enough uh, for me not to have information, not to be informed of the work's progress. So think of uh, the huge engagement and commitment of Cavour during uh, the time of Italian unification. Then, of course, they had some hinders uh, at the beginning in 18. 57, upon approval of uh, the uh, tunnel works, uh, Piedmont uh, and uh, Savoy were uh, included in the reign of Sardinia. Uh, however, Savoy then, between 86 and, and 861, uh, was given back to France. So, uh, the uh, French government would have become an interlocutor, a foreign interlocutor, because half uh, the work would become their property. So the Italian government demanded the French government to um, support half the expenses that had to be paid uh, in the future to finish, to complete the works. So the French government tried uh, only to uh, gain half of the profits, but they um, had a better judgment then. And uh, then they wanted to have sanctions uh, for any years uh, of delay in the uh, works completion. So rem remember that uh, only five years uh, had elapsed uh, from uh, the uh, approval of the works. And uh, actually, they still had 25 years to go. So Cavour said, right, we accept the sanctions. However, we also want to have some bonuses for every year of anticipation on the deadline. And then we know that they completed the tunnel in only 14 years. So here you see um, progress of excavation with and without boring machines. So from 20, 200 to 250 meters uh, for each, uh, from each portal uh, to 900 meters uh, with the boring machine. So it's uh, four to five um, times as much. Then here you see uh, the description of the uh, 
del 1800. Excavation of the last wall dividing the two sides of the tunnels uh, that uh, uh, occurred uh, at 4 p.m. on the 25th of December. Uh, and then they started hearing the uh, noises uh, from each side. Uh, so on the uh, 26th of December at uh, 5.20, the last mines blew up. And uh, finally, the two teams met at the beginning. And uh, may I remind you that the tracing uh, of the tunnel was practically Perfect. There were only 40 centimeter horizontally and 60 centimeter vertically uh, um, difference between the uh, northern and southern uh, portal. Uh, so. Uh, it is extraordinary if we think of uh, the. Uh, technology they had been using uh, for that work. So as I said, uh, the uh, works uh, were completed uh, on the 26th of December, 1870. So uh, nine months, um, slightly nine months after that, uh, it was inaugurated on the 17th of September, uh, 1871. So less than nine months. Uh, so it's a record time, actually. And uh, uh, here uh, you see uh, from 17th to 19th of September, it was a sort of national festival, national feast in Turin. So much less in France, because there are uh, books describing the works and the intervention of the different ministries at that time. De Vincenti, uh, De Vincentis, sorry, the Ministry uh, of Public Works, and uh, Quintino Sella, too. He was an engineer. Uh, De Latta was an engineer and an expert climber and founder of uh, CAI Italian Alpine Club. So they uh, delivered uh, uh, two speeches that uh, could sound uh, as uh, modern speeches. Uh, so may I invite you to read De Vincenti's and uh, uh, Quintino Sella's uh, speeches uh, delivered uh, during the inauguration on the tunnel. Here you see the uh, inaugural day uh, in Modan and in Bardonash. In Bardonash, there was a uh, um, uh, banquet, and then you see here the maiden trip across the tunnel. Uh, let's have a look at the costs. Uh, they started um, uh, at 40 million. Uh, um, of course, the cost increased uh, as the works went on because boring machines um, broke down, and it was actually uh, the first uh, uh, use, the first time they used, they were using this kind of machine. So they had also to adjust them. Uh, they needed to train workers, and last but not least, the materials came from abroad, and so there were high costs of transports. So there were no other communication ways. And so they had to climb up and down Monsigny Pass with all the difficulties uh, and uh, lengthy times uh, that I described at the beginning of my speech. And let's not forget that between the beginning and the end of the works, uh, the uh, reign of Italy uh, was involved uh, in many wars, uh, first, uh, second and third independence war. and. Uh, um, uh, they arrived in Rome, so uh, of course many funds were diverted to the wars, and so uh, they had to pay interest uh, in on the costs. However, parts of the cost was supported by France, uh, so half uh, of construction costs, and they also paid bonuses uh, because of the 15 years anticipation in the completion of the works. So this reduced uh, the uh, 
total cost for Italy uh, down to 42.2 million. And then, uh, of course, we need to uh, talk about injuries. Uh, 760 workers uh, hospitalized uh, and 48 casualties. However, 18, 18 out of 48 died uh, from a cholera epidemic in Badenesh and eight were killed in fights because after the works, the workers can only uh, get drunk. They were uh, isolated. There were no families with them. And especially in the, in the first uh, uh, years, they uh, had no houses. They just lived in the stables. And so um, they were um, affected by uh, the risk of fights. So uh, the uh, casualties uh, for the works in the tunnels uh, go down to 22. Of course, uh, it is 22 um, uh, too much, too many, uh, but uh, St. Gothard uh, Tano demanded 200 casualties. So it's uh, almost uh, 10 times as much. Uh, and 22 was lower than the average number of casualties for the great uh, public works uh, at that time. So recognition was a uh, huge uh, in Italy and abroad uh, on the scientific and the generic press. Uh, and uh, uh, Cavour inaugurated the monuments, uh, the um, homage to uh, uh, the workers. And uh, Mr. Virano reminded us that uh, that monument uh, w was uh, the uh, idea of the workers uh, to celebrate and to pay homage to uh, the engineers, because engineers were working inside the tunnels with the workers. Engineer Borelli uh, helped them and treated them and was a nurse for the uh, workers affected by cholera. He uh, entered into fights to increase their wage. Uh, and there are documents uh, proving that. So this is why the workers uh, firmly wanted uh, this monument. Uh, this is the monument stones that Virano talked about. Uh, uh, and today it uh, is uh, being exposed uh, to a Museo del Risorgimento, but was uh, uh, inaugurated uh, mon on Monday, the 6th of September, at uh, track one of Porta Nuova. It is recognized uh, by the Association of Civil Engineering, the Italian Association of Railway Engineers, RFE, and TELT, to pay homage to 48 workers who died. So they tried to balance the celebration and to remind them. So may I just uh, uh, remind uh, uh, a very uh, dramatic uh, uh, accident. In 1917, there were soldiers uh, going to France uh, going, well, they were going back to France, and the train just uh, exiting the tunnel uh, had had to uh, travel uh, on a very uh, steep slope. But the, unfortunately, the brakes uh, um, had a malfunction, and uh, all uh, the soldiers died. Uh, and uh, one important thing to uh, remember is that the uh, tunnel was closed uh, during Second World War, uh, some hours after the declaration of war of Mussolini to uh, the France. Uh, they closed uh, the uh, tunnel. It was then reopened by French soldiers and closed again by the uh, German soldiers. So uh, it was closed from 1940 to 1945, but then after the year 45, uh, no blocks um, were 
ever put uh, again. So we lived peacefully uh, with our neighbors. So in uh, 2001, we started talking about uh, uh, the new work for the tunnel and the summit in 2002 in order to extend uh, uh, the uh, section uh, to allow the passage of a railway line across that not only to extend the section, but but to increase its height by excavating 1 to 1.5 meter um, uh, vertically, if starting from the railway plan. So to conclude, uh, may I dedicate my last uh, slide to the library. Uh, keeping all the journals by civil engineering because the Civil Engineering Association uh, publish, used to publish the uh, works progress from time to time. And so if ever you are interested in consulting the uh, history uh, of the civil engineering from uh, 1861 to uh, its uh, and uh, but then uh, it the uh, public works uh, uh, unit uh, to cover. Uh, you have to go to this library uh, in the name of Umberto and Bruno Bucci, two employees at the Ministry of uh, Public Works. Uh, they were father and son. Uh, one was an employee in the civil engineer, and the other was a designer, a civil engineer, and they uh, were slaughtered uh, uh, in Rome uh, at the Fosse Ardeatine, uh, slaughtered by the Germans because they were uh, helping the Jews. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Cialdini. It is a very interesting aspect for future generations. Many students are connected with us today. so. Straight to the future, Andrea. Cialdini mentioned the uh, civil engineering sector. We have here Federico Cempella, the president of this association in, in Turin. Many initiatives have been developed for the future, so based on the very nice past for our future. So Federico, just a very short intervention. We are very late. I'm sorry, I know that these topics really need a lot of time to be dealt with, but it is a very important day today. So what are you doing for your future, for students, for specialized engineers, technicians of the future? Thank you, Fabrizio, um, for this, for the possibility to speak. I'm here also thanks to what Mr. Cialdini said. And I would like to thank the director of Academia Albertina and architect Vigano uh, Turin is a point of reference, an essential point of reference. In 2016, we had the opportunity to celebrate the 200th uh, anniversary. So there's roots of times that architect Viriano talked about. These allow us to make a leap towards a future perspective that includes an actual school for civil engineering just like the um, Cavour's school. So in this ecological transition, this uh, climate transition, we need this. And I would like to thank you not only for the support of TELT to uh, this activity of ours, but in particular for the possible consequences of such a project, of a training school, a very important school for civil engineering. The modern society absolutely needs such a school. 
What does it mean? What does civil engineering mean? There's a word that we know that is designing and realizing public infrastructures. You said that very clearly. We need to be a school uh, that meets the needs and the levels of each times because technology should be linked to art and beauty. This is why I thank our friend Fabrizio Postolo to allow me to say that this project, which we used our best energies uh, to calip for war, and at the University La Sapienza of Roma and also the Polytechnical Universities of Turin and Milan, the Albertina School, they will start such a project for a superior second um, level school. So this is why today I would really like to uh, witness our commitment for the Italian society and for our whole national system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ciampella. And now vision rail. Let's move to the future, uh, crossing the present. So we are connected now with two very important people from two companies that are working to build the future. Telt and BBT, Brenner Tunnel. So, first of all, a general introduction of the two infrastructures through um, the um, uh, intervention by Xavier Damendray, the uh, director for France of Telt, and then Giuseppe Venditti, in charge of BBT Italy, so West and East, two fundamental European corridors. Xavier Damendrei, first of all, the world is the world, floor is yours. Here you are. Good morning, good morning, everyone. After what Cialdini said, and before moving on moving forward for 150 years for technological reasons. I would like to tell you that working sites are already uh, being performed in the in saint jean maurien area with the um, construction of the international station, the works of the Tranchet Couvert, and also the uh, ventilation shafts in Avril that have just started, and also the niches in the Maddalena Tunnel from the Italian side. You surely know that we also signed last September the three main contracts for en civil engineering, so for the construction of the base tunnel, 3 billion euros of works. My colleague Lorenzo Brino is going to talk about the technological aspects of this intervention. So we still have some contracts to be um, to sign for the Italian side of the base tunnel, a civil engineering contract, some other works, um, external outdoor, outdoor works, and the management of excavated materials, both from the French and the Italian side. And obviously, a very important one for a railway and non-railway uh, equipment for the base tunnel. We are, and my colleague, Xavier Bongard, is going to talk about this later. I'd like to insist on a point, TELT thinks it is very important the way these works are carried out. In particular, as for the respect of environment that was mentioned by the general director of TELT at the beginning of the seminar. And we also think that respect of people is as just as important. Works, workers, but also local residents. In particular, the general director of Irano talked about the security, the uh, sorry, safety, uh, 
within working sites. And we think that the integration of this project is very important to benefit also, uh, to, to provide benefits also to the territory. And an important aspect is anti-corruption policies. This point allows us to highlight something that is fundamental in our project and within our company, TELT, binational character. So the anti-mafia policies is a unique example where a law of a country, Italy, has been extended and applied in our country, in France. And uh, so every day we have integrated teams with Italian and French colleagues working together, together with International um, Intergovernmental Committee to deal with topics like the reuse of excavated materials. So just to conclude very briefly, I would say that in this um, moment where we have very large working sites, TELT is starting moving towards future. Uh, that uh, will be the management of this infrastructure. So we are going to talk about this in November, next November. So thank you for your kind attention and enjoy. Have a fruitful seminar, you all. Thank you. Thank you once again. So the idea of Europe is absolutely fundamental. And the designer of the uh, Milan-Naples uh, motorway that was a bit, that was defined as the spine of Italy, the backbone of Italy. We could say that the same thing of this new uh, infrastructure, the beyond terrain connection. So Turin and BBT, um, sorry, TELT and BBT, large uh, society, large companies for large connections. Now BBT, we have Mr. Giuseppe Venditti in charge of the Italian side of BBT. Here you are. Welcome. Welcome to this seminar. He will talk about this other very important infrastructure, which is a bit uh, a twin um, infrastructure and that is being built and that will be used and will be absolutely fundamental and needed in the future. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Apostolo. Thank you on behalf of BBC. I would also like to thank you for inviting me and all our friends. I greet them all our friends. So I have a presentation. Here it is. I'd like to be, um, I, I'll try to be fast. So a general topic, the phrase volume in 2017. It is interesting to see what is the relationship between uh, the ratio between um, road and rail transportation. So obviously, the sustainability goals of Europe, in particular environmental sustainability, cannot be met. The same can be said talking about our own corridor, the Brenner Corridor. You can see that the trend over the years of the two uh, types of transportation, road and rail, you can see that the augmentation is significant between 17 and 18, and that um, absolutely sees that road transportation is much more frequently used. So the project of European corridors that I think are one of the most European things that have been done in Europe over the last years is something that just uh, like a previous uh, speaker said, was used and allowed to um, 
uh, refurbish old structures, old infrastructures, just like the Brenner railway line that was built in the second half of the 19th century. But this will allow also to um, transfer freight um, transportation from road to rail to meet the very strict goals that Europe set in terms of sustainability. BBT uh, is to be found along the longest corridor from the Scandinavian area to the Mediterranean. You can see it in pink. And on you can see on the right a scheme, a, a sort of um, uh, the goal of the project. The blue line is the existing railway line that was built in the 19th century and that was refurbished later, but it reaches 1,300 meters of altitude. And then we'll have, and then there is a, um, a level of altitude of 500 meters in Innsbruck. So it is absolutely an obsolete technology for such a modern railway infrastructure that is mainly used for freight transportation. And then in green, you can see the new base tunnel with the altitude that is quite different. So also from a chart a point of view, you can see that the existing infrastructure is very uh, costly and expensive and has different, um, well, a track that is not that easy to, to use. Here you can see how it is made. So this Brenner base tunnel, you have the two red lines that are the two um, single, um, sorry, the two single board, uh, the, uh, the, the twin board um, tunnel. And then will be 55 kilometers of connection between Forteza and Innsbruck and nine kilometers that have already been built to connect the tunnel, Brenner Base Tunnel and the existing Innsbruck Ring Road. So this is a detail of the two tunnels. We can also see uh, this shaft at the center that is uh, 12 meters lower, and that was used for explorations. And it will be also used to access some of the equipment of the tunnels. Quite quickly, here you have the geological profile of the area. We have granite and other um, grass um, schist. And in blue, you can see the areas that were excavated with uh, TBMs and the areas that have been excavated or will be excavated with a drill and blast um, system. So we have more or less 50% and 50% as a percentage. Quite quickly, quite quick, quickly, uh, we also we already excavated. Well, for this 50 kilometers of connection, we have to uh, excavate tunnels. We have already completed 50, uh, 60 percent, 144 kilometers. And on the left, you can also see the location. So the structure in green. And in yellow, you have the areas that have already been excavated, whereas in gray, you can see the areas, the sections that still need to be um, excavated or that are being uh, worked at the moment. This is one of the areas at the north near Innsbruck. The areas are mainly open air, so out of the, of the uh, galleries of the tunnels. But this area is very important for the environmental context and the landscape as well, which is very important in the south of uh, south of, of Innsbruck. Here, for those who are not experts, this is an image that was added to show an example of the, the machines used 
tunnel to excavate so this TBM, tunnel boring machines, that allow to excavate our uh, tunnels. You can see this, um, the, the, the head of the machine and uh, the tail, um, let's say, of the machine, so all the other equipment that is used to complete the excavation. These are examples of uh, tunnels excavated via drill and bust techniques. So you have the tunnel that uh, just before the rails are uh, installed. This is quite a peculiar work that is uh, ongoing at the south of the base tunnel. We are near Fortezza. You can see the Isarco um, River. We need to excavate under the, um, the river without changing its um, configuration. We have four tunnels, the two tunnels to interconnect the Fortezza station, railway station. So we are freezing the soil and uh, the, uh, the river to be able to excavate the tunnels with just some meters uh, above our head, so just five, four meters, without changing the actual um, river flow. You can see the galleries, the tunnels that have already been uh, excavated in blue and in yellow, the tunnels that are being um, carried out, that are being excavated. And this is the final slide. This shows you um, that today, a big part of the projects and investments that are made are made to protect the territory and the landscape. So here we are in the Isarco Valley, in um, the working site that we have just seen on the previous slide. This is next to the Brenner Railway, um, sorry, a motorway. You can see it on screen. This in blue is the river that we have just seen. And in yellow, the railway historical, um, historic railway line that reaches the Brenner Pass. And this is more or less the tunnel that lies under all these infrastructures. So most of the works were focused on the protection and the functionality also during the excavation of the tunnel of all these infrastructures. So we saw this in the previous slides, but also other investments, other interventions, and other projects have been carried out to, uh, for um, railway infrastructures and motorway infrastructures that were not stopped or slowed down during the excavation phases. In particular, this section where the BBT tunnel is quite, is not, it's quite shallow, it's not very deep in the ground. So this is the end of my presentation, and I thank you all for this, uh, for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Venditti, so of course you, you couldn't hear it maybe, but uh, he's been applauded because uh, it is an intense collaboration uh, we heard about. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty uh, of our seminars with uh, Mr. Lorenzo Brino, the director of engineering unit in TELT. So we want to speak about uh, engineering. So uh, we heard about the boring machine designed by uh, Sommelier 
used by the workers um, who excavated the first uh, uh, tunnel. So how can you see, how can you describe uh, a modern boring machine, uh, the 2020 or 2021 uh, third millennia boring machine? What can you tell us about that and about the excavation? So may I start by... Uh, saying hello to my friend uh, uh, Giuseppe Venditti. We had uh, many occasions uh, to uh, collaborate and to work together. Uh, so, uh, Sommelier's boring machine, uh, you mentioned that. Uh, and we need to start from that to speak about modern technology. Um, because uh, the Freshers Tunnel is 12 uh, kilometers long, and uh, it is uh, a single tube uh, tunnel. And uh, it uh, was part uh, of a generation uh, of uh, tunnels uh, at the height of the pass, um, San Gottardo, Sempione, and Freyus. So uh, it uh, is. Uh, the result uh, of great labor, because uh, at least uh, 2,000 people were working all together on each side uh, in a tunnel, in a hole that had some uh, just some meters radius. Today, we're here to work uh, on uh, modern tunnels uh, from 30 to 50 kilometer long, uh, which were which are excavated at the uh, um, zero meters level. So, of course, uh, we need to think that uh, 150 years later, the same 12 kilometer long tunnels of our Fraser's tunnel uh, correspond to 50 kilometer base tunnel and with two tubes with a whole uh, length of 160 kilometers length. So you see, uh, this is just to give you an idea of how much the technology evolved and uh, of how conscious we should be of safety conditions of environmental um, impact reduction. So. Uh, the evolution is not to be referred only uh, to the way we excavate the tunnel, but also to everything which goes with it. So today, uh, we use the tunnel boring machines. That's how we call them TBM. So these machines are used to bore tunnels. These are sort of uh, um, construction and um, boring units excavating and lining um, the uh, tunnel 10 meter per 10 meter section. So in the Brenner, they have similar figures. So we will have eight TBMs working in parallel uh, uh, to uh, realize uh, our epic works, uh, just as epic as the tunnel, Frisius Tunnel was 150 years ago. However, our figures are uh, extremely higher. So uh, mechanical boring uh, is something worth knowing and worth telling because it is connected to uh, a stronger and stronger relationship between uh, men and the machine. Yes, it stems from an industrial uh, organization of the works, which is moving underground. So mm, the young engineers are eager to know uh, and to uh, see it uh, live uh, when possible. And I think that's uh, very uh, relevant to remember and to remind that there are these uh, possibilities of visits for them. So. We have very quick interventions now in this last part of our event. So 
uh, we uh, mentioned uh, machines and materials uh, before uh, for the traditional, uh, the first tunnel. We need to remind equipment because they are uh, where technologies can express itself better. So, uh, of course, we need to better communicate that the passage of train occurs uh, inside uh, a safer and better controlled uh, environment. And so it is really worth uh, explaining how uh, it is possible. We have three experts. So uh, may I, before, leave the floor to another guest, uh, Mr. Francesco Troncone, engineer of BBT Impianti Italia, so uh, experts in equipment. So I have a question for him. Can you summarize uh, your work, your current work on equipment at at the moment, looking at another red thread uniting our speech, which is sustainability and viability uh, of our works, uh, because designing equipment today uh, means making them viable for a long time in the future in railway facilities. So, uh, may I leave the floor to Mr. Troncone? He is here. Okay. Welcome and good morning. I hope you can hear me. So, may I give my welcome to all the uh, participants and the audience and thanks uh, to uh, the speakers uh, that uh, spoke before me because they introduced so many issues uh, and put them on the table for discussion. So, uh, talking about equipment. BBT today is making huge efforts to integrate technological systems and equipment to the railway facilities. So, um, of course, those systems are nothing like something we could see 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, everything connected to control uh, of the trains is new and in line with the European directives. Uh, uh, may I highlight two uh, key aspects. First and foremost, the integration of uh, different systems uh, with a view not only to connect the two uh, uh, systems um, on both sides of the border, but um, uh, to uh, have a better integration across Europe. So uh, this is uh, an effort, and uh, this effort includes also cultural in aspects, uh, cultural in the sense uh, the, of technical cultures. So we are a transnational uh, company, and uh, in our everyday work, we want to uh, share typical Italian and uh, Austrian technical experiences. And believe me, this is a huge effort. However, we are being rewarded for our efforts because uh, we uh, work in consultation and uh, make uh, ideas and projects in common, uh, respecting and complying with both uh, ideas uh, and uh, technical cultures. As far as uh, uh, a purely technological point of view uh, is concerned, uh, may I underline not only the innovation expressed uh, in the equipment, but uh, on the efforts uh, in order for all the subsystems composing uh, such a complex uh, facility as a railway tunnel to interact uh, to one another in a correct way to ensure safety of the whole work. 
non so se eh, prima si parlava di cultura cooperativa. So before uh, you mentioned three uh, key terms culture cooperation and uh, then another term community right Well I I, I fully share your opinion because uh, these three key terms uh, better express the spirit of our commitment uh, in the work uh, Italian and technical Italian and Austrian technicians thank you thank you so one of the pillars uh, are of a European community is uh, environmental sustainability. One is environmental sustainability and the other is uh, digitalization. May I now open the floor with uh, Xavier Baumgart from TELT uh, in charge uh, of uh, systems uh, and uh, technology. So two words about uh, uh, the work you're doing in TELT uh, for the digitization of the railway line and future trains uh, with a view to keeping the facility viable and uh, uh, environmentally friendly. So uh, welcome, Xavier. You have the floor. Bonjour à tous. So uh, good morning. Thanks uh, for inviting me to this round table. Uh, of course, as you could uh, think of it, uh, I uh, fully agree with what my colleague said before uh, and uh, of the main uh, importance, uh, of the highest importance uh, of uh, the integration of systems. Um, so uh, today we are living uh, in a world of digitization, not only of the networks, but also of the systems. So uh, digitization of sending and crossings uh, has advanced uh, hugely because uh, uh, ERTMS uh, has imposed uh, a new digital standard offering uh, incredible opportunities because uh, thanks to these systems, all trains uh, can be located accurately. So that's a real revolution for railway networks because um, uh, signing in, uh, analogic, uh, uh, analogical signing systems uh, uh, did, had not allowed uh, precise and accurate uh, uh, localization of trains. And this can enhance uh, safety hugely, and that was the main goal uh, for this uh, new systems, but also allows uh, energy saving and increases comfort of uh, passengers. So we can know where the train exactly is, and so this means uh, uh, lighting up uh, the lights uh, of the tunnel continuously is just useless because uh, we just need to uh, lit the tunnel as uh, a train can be stopped uh, inadvertently there. So this allows to save energies used for lighting. So uh, digitization goes beyond those because uh, uh, vent all the systems for uh, ventilation, firefighting and others uh, are uh, digitized. So mm, we can n measure uh, all air flows uh, inside the tunnel uh, and so we will not need to use mechanical ventilation. On the other hand, uh, we can use natural ventilation created by uh, weather conditions uh, on both ends uh, of the uh, tunnels and the shafts. And so, so these are practical examples of energy savings that are allowed by the uh, network digitization. Uh, one last example. 
uh, oh, I mentioned passengers comforts uh, well the tunnel is just a chain uh, in a it's just a link in the chain uh, of uh, the trip and journey of passengers so uh, we can uh, calculate uh, the passage of tunnel in the uh, tunnel in real time. So uh, signals will be open, and uh, as a train arrives uh, in the uh, different stations, uh, it will be able to pass with no delays. So we can maximize uh, the um, speed of the train according to the real-time calculations made. And these calculations are extremely accurate. So the train is not running uh, 200 kilometers uh, per hour if there are some freight trains um, ahead of it. So uh, this speed will be adjusted, and this means that energy uh, will be substantially saved. So, to conclude, uh, the uh, wave for digitization uh, will result in higher safety, energy saving, and uh, uh, higher comfort uh, for passengers. And uh, as a uh, uh, side effect, uh, they will also facilitate the work uh, of uh, maintenance uh, operators because there will be uh, digital diagnostics uh, over time. So a huge construction yard, extremely interesting perspective. And then, uh, of course, we are expecting further development uh, of uh, in artificial intelligence to enhance the potential of our equipment and to work in an even more subtle way. So being uh, seduced by new technologies uh, that uh, we are working on for tomorrow. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you, Xavier. So we have uh, uh, international guests uh, and new equipment. So may I leave the floor to Stefan Boscheri from BBT, uh, Austria Equipment. So uh, we just go from France to Austria, crossing Turin from Vision Ray. So uh, may I ask the same question? Uh, I asked uh, Xavier uh, with a small addition. So from BBT point of view, how are technology being applied to improve the environmental impact of the work? So uh, one um, key issue is uh, environmental sustainability, and on the other side, uh, to, to uh, enhance uh, the uh, life of the uh, work, so about durability. And then, uh, can you mention one system that could be particularly interesting for our audience? So, uh, Stefan Boscari, you have the floor. Are you connected? Can you hear us? OK, sorry. I just detected the microphone. Hello, everybody from Innsbruck, uh, which is the Austrian office of BPD. Uh, I think what belongs to the safe uh, or to the main topics of environmental, environmental sustainability, uh, my former colleague, Mr. Baumgart, already told, I think, the most uh, specific systems uh, that will help us. But uh, belonging to the second question you told us, uh, the enablers and the game-changing systems. So that's, I think that's one of the main systems that BPD will have to face. Uh, it's the communication topic. Uh, the UIC, uh, together with the European Rail Agency, developed a system in the late 90s, beginning 2000 years, uh, called GSMR. 
what we were facing is the GSMR had a big impact and was a huge success all over Europe to have a unified communication system for all railways. But GSMR was based on a very old technology. Uh, you know it as GSM or the 2G technology mobile systems. When you're looking now, uh, the mobile communication world has involved uh, from 3G UMTS over 4G LTE to the actual rollout of the 5G new radio system. So industry will no longer provide old systems like GSM, also from a safety aspect. Now there's a new system in development, it's called the FRMCS, the Future Railway Mobile Communication System. And with the start of service of BPD in 2030 or 2032, um, FRMCS will be the communication system for railways. The FRMCS system itself is not only usable for speech, for ETCS, train control, but also for all other systems that railway uh, is necessary for railways. So for example, uh, the locomotive sends a report to the maintenance facility about failures and such things. Uh, also real-time communication uh, with maybe ATCS level three. So where is the train before me without uh, the fixed blocks, but using the moving block system. So these all things that will help to make railway more safety, uh, to have less power you need uh, because you don't have to stop so often, and also uh, to rise the sa uh, safety aspect for safer train operations. Thank you, thank you, engineer. Yeah, we are a bit late. I'm sorry about that, but some questions will be asked now. We are going to choose one. We have several questions, but this will be answered later directly from this, uh, the speakers, also the slides will be shared, so you have the chance to um, discuss about things further. So just one question to summarize this morning's uh, session. Um, just one question, sorry. Mr. Virano, please, could you please answer this question? I think you are the best. 100 years ago, it was necessary to encourage the use of the new railway and the tunnel, and if they did, what resistance did they encounter, and how did they overcome it? from 50, 150 years ago. So this historic event can also help the new Leon Turin line or to overcome some problems in its realization. So this is the question of um, from the audience. Thank you. Well, this is a very interesting question and it is also uh, a bit funny in a way because Cavour, as well, had to discuss within the parliament with the first knot of representatives, the first knot of, so those who are against the high speed uh, line. So there was the um, a representative of the, an MP that was Christopher Moya, who um, explained why that infrastructure we are talking about was not to be built. The reasons were exactly the same as the ones that are um, expressed today. Cost, time, feasibility, alternatives, priorities, and some problems, some um, concerns for what is inside the mountains. At that time, we didn't talk about uranium or Raiden or um, um, 
asbestos, but they uh, talked about fire, water, uh, some um, uh, collapses. So all these things that obviously we uh, must take into consideration, but that we have to face and solve. So what can we understand from this experience? Well, something that I think, I think is absolutely um, um, interesting from a cultural and political point of view is that in the declaration, in the presentation of Cavour, when he says you should avoid halfways, either you, are, you agree or you don't. There is no grain section, gray section. You have to be pro and con, and you have to take your own responsibility. I think this is absolutely um, applicable today, and gray zones, gray areas in politics, the change in opinions according to uh, the elections, well, this does not belong to authorities that take decisions that will be applicable and valuable for hundreds of years and that will orientate the society, cultures, and politics for the future. So I think that conflict of that time is still present today. The situations are very similar, yet there is a general democracy principles behind it. So we had to fight against continuous tests, um, actions, and different reactions, also violent reactions. This, what, what was, what is the result of all that? All those who are working on it need to find uh, better best practices and everything. So it also has a good effect. Okay, so talking about teaching, we have a final connection with the uh, Liceo Porporato, so a secondary school in Pinerolo, Piedmont region. We have Professor Trucco. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. We are sorry we are a bit late. Thank you. Well, I thank you all on behalf of the students that unfortunately are not here anymore, so they went home. I'm sorry. Uh, the, um, the school time was, was over, but I have some questions to ask on behalf of students. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, in a video that we analyzed, Indian political scientist Paragada Kanna says that the construction of large infrastructures at a worldwide level can help international connections so much as to ease the possibility of conflicts and war. So will the uh, European Rail Corridor also help peace between countries? Uh, can I ask the three questions together? Well, maybe one at a time. I think it is more, um, it is a better solution. So this first question is very nice and quite interesting. Even if it is not so shared, well, also in uh, on um, in the United Nations, United Nations level, railway safety infrastructures and the uh, contribution of infrastructure for peace, for instance. So here we have Professor Sebastiano Pelizza, who is an expert in the academia, in particular in the sector of engineering. And he also talked about our world and he teaches our world in an extraordinary way. So maybe Professor Berizza could help us answer this question. So how can infrastructure help peace, create and keep peace? So this major infrastructure is going to go beyond the engineering aspect and do something more for our communities. So could you come here on, on stage, please? He will also help answer the other questions together with the other guests. Thank you, Professor Berizza. Sorry for this. 
a surprise, unexpected surprise. Well, I do not know whether this is an added value, but I will try and say a couple of things quite briefly. In reference, I'd like to make reference to what um, Professor Architect Virano said at the beginning. So, in brief, in a nutshell, I could say something that you would not maybe like, but still. So I think the 150th anniversary of the Frisius Tunnel is a fundamental date in the history of tunnels. Because on the one hand, it makes us understand that the historic service of Fréjus and historic railway lines and other tunnels as well, let's say traditional tunnels after the Fréjus was built, this is coming to an end. So in 20 years, maybe, the Fréjus will not be useful anymore for the actual um, modern, let's say, railway service for the big um, transportation systems. Why? What? We'll, uh, what, what, is it, what, what is it that changes in the future? So the uh, railway tunnels are going to change. The history of new tunnels has already begun. In the first 50 years of the new millennium, the new railway tunnels were born, and they will uh, keep developing that way, we hope. Architect Virano said that, oh, yes, we have to cross them, but we also have to cross many other things in Europe. In urban areas, Europe is an urban area. So to reach and to move around in the largest, in the larger um, Euro Asian continent, because we know that we need to use railway for transportation, for freight transportation in particular. So I think that new tunnels have nothing to do with the Frederick style tunnel. Why? Because new galleries, new tunnels need to be long and straight. So they can be, they must be in depth. Well, designing such a deep tunnel that is maybe 60 kilometers long, the three tunnels we mentioned today are 60 kilometers long, this is something that is thoroughly new. And so here we have the new science. Frejus started with a, like a Minecraft, a craftsman um, work using mines. But this work, thanks to Cavour and the other engineers that were working with him, was just a way to say, OK, let's start, because we need to build this tunnel, because we have clients, the railway company, that is insisting. So Cavour is very pragmatic, very practical. He knows that uh, the client will uh, sign a contract after that. So this is a reality, a truth. And then we have the uh, age of art of tunneling, so the art as a craft. And here we uh, need maybe another to hold another seminar, art as a thought, as a spirit, the um, idea of beauty. But I'm not going to talk about this because we have no time today. And now like, a last thing to say is that today the art of tunneling is not sufficient to build these deep and long tunnels. Why? Because this is something totally new. We do not know them. We do not know them. I had the chance, thanks to our friends here, to work, to cooperate with the two major tunnels, railway tunnels. I am just a consultant, so I am a small 
secondary level consultant. But I know what are the problems under Monsigny and Brenner. And I also do know what the problems are in St. Gotthard, because in the preliminary design phase, I also cooperated with them. So what are the main problems? We have these tunnels that are 1,000 meters deep. Tunnels are made by engineers, but we tend to forget ge geologists because we know geomechanics and geologists, engineers, well, we need to put them together. We need to have data, but we need to know geology and geomechanics in particular. And this is a challenge, and we still do not know how to manage these things. So we made explorations and, and inquiries, but we can see that this is not sufficient. This is not enough. So first of all, knowledge. Then this depth means that rocks are behaving in an odd way that we do not know. We saw this at Brenner and in the experimental um, work inside of the Munsani, but we know that these are new objects and science will be absolutely of paramount importance. F training and education will be. But engineer, you know that Italy is an anomaly. We have 60 million inhabitants and we have 21 universities, engineering universities. You cannot have 21 uh, professor groups, groups of professors to teach engineering. So please be careful about that. You should do what Napoleon did. That would be nice, but in Italy, this is not possible. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. Well, please listen. Long and deep tunnels are not an easy object to deal with. They are extremely difficult to study, and may, first of all, this is very difficult to um, build, because if we do not know the situation, uh, we do not know what the situation is. If we cannot understand the rocks and the rock types, etc., we'll need to do that using machines, as Mr. Brino said. He was a student of mine, by the way. So these machines will be the machines of the future. But we'll need to know what is the geology of the area to be the right machine to work in this. So we need to explore as we advance, as we progress, and this is a whole new chapter. Thank you. Okay, so just to provide a further uh, answer to Professor Mrs. Trucco, I would say that these international projects like TELS and BBT that are multilingual um, projects, I think, well, you also have a linguistic uh, secondary school language secondary school, so the study of languages in contexts that are not only traveling and that, et cetera, but cooperation and cooperation, um, international cooperation, so moving all towards the same um, direction. I think that this culture of sharing, according to my own experience, is a very important element for peace. So working all together, looking all this to the same direction. Infrastructures in the past were also used to conquer during wars. Um, but I think that digitalization and the sharing, this um, being together very close one to the other, we can, and the environment, of course, and research and development, we can also think that infrastructures are instruments of peace. I think that the technical communities are doing so on a daily basis. You have the floor for the next questions. The second question, there is a lot of investment in large-scale infrastructure, but we have the feeling that little thought is given to the micro dimension, so local uh, travels, which suffer the most, and many of us students experience this fragility on a daily basis. So to be complete, the mobility project shouldn't Maybe uh, should the mobility project integrate the two dimensions? 
Well, I think that in terms of new uh, policies, uh, well, besides the transformation of the name of the ministry for sustainable infrastructures and sector, uh, a, a new document has been recently approved that provides for a more, um, let's say, uh, structured investments for uh, long and for, for local um, transportation, local travel. So these two dimensions should, uh, should be a parallel, should be held in parallel. So international and BBC and TELT, international companies, BBC and TELT, are investing a lot in, on the territory. I know about a compensation work on, on, on the roads, but the same thing is applied in railway world. I don't know whether someone, maybe architect Mr. Virano, who is an expert, would like to add something. I'll go back to the previous questions, if I may, because when secondary school students talk about peace, we have to be serious about that. Uh, I'd like to add something to integrate what has been said. First of all, when I started working on these topics, something that I found incredible was that railway lines on both sides of borders have totally different features, characteristics from uh, power to and, and voltage um, that changes in, in different countries. The size of uh, rails is different sometimes, and a number of things like that. And at the beginning, I thought it was absolutely absurd, very stupid um, things. And then I asked why. The reason was military reasons. In the negative, so I'm meaning the negative threat, military threat. So each state tended to avoid that the neighboring countries could uh, load uh, weapons on a train and move them rapidly to invade another country. So this meant that we have uh, difficulties for tourism, etc. So changing such a system that fragments different interests to make it fluid as it is today, starting, well, in 2021, thanks to interoperability, the movement in any European country of the European Union, let's start from this level. So just as if I was traveling in my own country, well, this is an incredible message of peace that is built and applied in the actual reality. So guys, you are uh, conveying a fundamental message, a network, a transportation network for people, for freight, with no barriers. This is the first prerequisite for a non-aggressive attitude. And then, in some years, not many years, just a few years, the TNT network, the nine corridors, will be completed, or mainly completed, mostly completed. We'll have a new situation because in Europe, we'll have a sort of European um, underground uh, network where we have the different stops that are the different cities, and the time needed to move from one city to another will be less, will be lower than crossing 
uh, each city from one side to the other. So this large urban area, which is Europe, that is a very green continent that looks like a big city that needs to be managed with a care for the environment. So such a big city that is interconnected, this is a message of peace. Nobody in their own city can even think about having a neighborhood that is fighting against another neighborhood. So if Europe becomes a large, a huge city, a single city that is sustainable from an environmental point of view, that is interconnected by this continental underground train, the message that is conveyed and understood in each city, this, it will become a general uh, message for everybody. And then this integrated content, um, continent will need to work for peace on an international scale, intercontinental scale. And of course, this is a new topic for European defense and politics and policies, etc. But still, as for transportation, this role is absolutely fundamental. The relationship between these different aspects we mentioned and the second question, that is the need for local uh, transportation and the investments for local transportation. Well, this has to do with large cities or medium-large cities within the network of underground trains. And this serves a large territory from the centers, from uh, railway stations, connecting the smaller stations. This is a complementary, uh, let's say, a supplementary message. So the new generation of transportation of different kinds that we are specifically uh, talking about, that are mainly electric-powered networks, this becomes the new challenge that each neighborhood, each every single city or town or a small village is will have to play for the whole system to be fully integrated. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a final question, I suppose. Yes. May I thank um, Mr. Virano for this reflection, because uh, we will have time to uh, explore the, the points mentioned by him in class with my um, pupils. So um, partially you have already answered the third question, but uh, I can uh, say that anyway. So record uh, timeline for the construction of the fridges and the use uh, of uh, uh, newest technologies was an extraordinary opportunity for the uh, United uh, Italy. What are uh, the characteristics that can be still useful in 2021 and which limits can be found? No, non c'è problema. Unfortunately, we really need to uh, hear the intervention in the microphone, please. Thank you. So, as I said before, long tunnels uh, are something new. Uh, Mr. Virano explained very uh, clearly uh, the purpose. Uh, may I add something from my experience uh, working with uh, the companies uh, constructing these three tunnels I mentioned before, these are the longest tunnels in the world. Uh, let's be mindful of that. So, uh, based on my experience, there are three different contracts be between principals and contractors. So, three different uh, criteria, three different rationals. So, but there are huge differences between them. So today it will be the right time to unify 
Europe geographically and also contractually so that we have all the companies at the same levels when they participate uh, uh, in uh, calls for tenders, for example. However, experience taught me that the three different uh, basic contracts can, can make the uh, execution of the works uh, more or less complex uh, for, for, for long tunnels, of course. So, Professor Pelizza uh, partially answered uh, your questions, be, your question before, uh, if you allow me. So, we have already talked about uh, uh, the their limits, and uh, if possible, uh, may I leave the floor to Professor Cialdini uh, to complete the answer. So, how could uh, Fraser's Tunnel become so important, uh, and why was it uh, the, uh, the driver of such uh, an evolution and a growth for our country? So, uh, Professor Cialdini, you have the floor. So, uh, why? Why Fraser's Tunnel? Well, uh, it's, it's the asset, the main asset of the tunnel and of the uh, people who worked for it. It was well designed and uh, well built. Uh, let me just uh, say something about the uh, peacemaking power of uh, uh, the tunnels. So uh, we were reminded that the tunnel uh, was closed during the Second World War, but af in the aftermath, and so far it has been opened. Uh, so it's just like a bridge. Uh, if you have mountains across the border, we cannot uh, build a bridge. We have to uh, excavate a tunnel. Uh, so um, as uh, the pontiff says we need to uh, build bridges. Uh, I would say we uh, need to build tunnels. And then, of course, it was, as uh, I said before, to go back to the last question, it was well designed, well built, and it was designed uh, facetedly uh, to connect not only f Bardenesh and Modan, but the port of Genoa to France. So all the designers uh, did not see a connection from Turin to the rest uh, of Europe, but from the port of Genoa to the rest of Europe. So if you uh, have uh, read uh, of the uh, speeches uh, before the construction and during the inauguration, the connection to the port of Gino was always mentioned. And uh, they saw it in projection uh, as a connection to Suez Canal, so the rest of the Eastern world. So East and West were united by uh, Suez Canal and by the Fraser Tunnel. So that was basic. That was key. And in my opinion, this is the key takeaway message for this work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Engineer Cialdini. So, uh, so just to uh, close up our meeting, to wrap up, uh, thinking means design, means actions, and means uh, 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 collaboration, so we can work together. So may I now remind you that uh, we have a final webinar, uh, third and final webinar uh, dedicated to interoperability for Vision Ray events. May I um, thank uh, the organizers, the technicians, all the guests, and uh, all the people who uh, who work hard day by day uh, for the realization of this work and all the youth 
So uh, I, I uh, am not an engineer. I have um, known it um, late in my life because I am trained in human science. But l listening to the professor speaking about uh, how arts beauty and engineers can intertwine. Uh, it's wonderful for me because I see that new ideas can thrive for it. So may I thank all the pupils and the students and thank you very much to all the guests. See you in November.